Thanks, John. As always, man. You sound great. Check, check. All right. Rob, good job, man. You made some coffee. did it, then. Yeah. Welcome, everybody. Let's give out some awards today. I was thinking about this. There's five awards that can be given. Uh, Rob, you can have the award for being yourself and getting people on this side of the room. George to be best, hardest working goes to George. Most astute to Dick. Best volunteer, Laura. Laura in the back. Coolest new couple, Candace and Patrick. And then uh, Chase Perez, best dressed right here. Uh, good to see everybody. Uh, if you're here for the first time, there's nothing to do. There's just exits right here and here. No membership. No, uh, no pressure here. Uh, we're talking about uh, this church, what we're trying to do, who we are. That, that stuff has to, be re, uh, has to be addressed often. We have to be reminded of the things we're supposed to do, reminded of the things that we already uh, know. But there's so many ways to think about God. There's so many ways to think about the faith. So many, so many ways to think about your life and how that fits in. And most of us are looking for something that works for us, that, 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 that serves us, a way to think about things. And usually those, uh, the ways that, the things that we choose are things that serve us, like literally, they just work for us. Um, I believe this is true. You don't have to agree with me. Dick thinks it's hogwash, but I believe that we, we don't really do what our minds say that we should do. We say that we think about things logically and we ch make choices based on our thinking. But I think that in our heart, we choose what we want. And then our hearts tell our minds to justify reasons why we want it. And so deep down, we're all doing what we want. We're all being as selfish as we possibly can. And uh, we're cloaking that uh, greed and selfishness with just a lot of uh, hogwash. But it sounds good. If we can argue our way and we can make people believe us, then we can justify our own existence and what we want to do. And so that works for our Christianity. It works for everything. And, uh, and I do the same thing. And so I'm not, I'm not I'm, but, but we need something else. We need a true north. That's why the scriptures, that's why the, the Christian community that's why two are better than one, because they bring back a greater return. You bring some accountability in that, and, uh, and then you can actually, uh, this stuff can actually help us. Uh, and, and I think the same goes with good statements. You know, you can pick metaphors for the way that you want to live, and everybody does. We all pick metaphors for how we want to live. You say life is like a box of chocolates or whatever, you know, or life is like a this or that, and we just have these metaphors. I've always appreciated Parker Palmer. He said we have to pick our metaphors for life very wisely, because you'll live, actualize those metaphors. And if you imagine that this is a battlefield, that the life is a battle and this is a war and we have people to fight, then you're going to think of things in terms of assets and casualties and, and, and everything will become a war zone for you. And, and that's a bad metaphor. Uh, where, whereas if you contrast that with something like seasons of life, then you can, there's room for that, and, but it, it's helpful at the same time. And so I have just sort of fixed in on these, these three things that I heard a Mennonite theologian speak of. I'm not thinking that we've become Mennonites. All right, when I, I shave every time. When somebody tells me I look like a Mennonite, I go home and shave my beard. So I'm not trying to go there. But uh, they're, I like the Mennonites because they, they, they have just the way that they think is right, and they do what they think that they should do, and there's conviction there. And, uh, and you know, you can't argue uh, with the fact that, th that their communities are successful and that they're living successful lives, whatever success means. I say that success is just a life that you and God are both happy with. But this theologian, this Mennonite guy said that, 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 that Mennonites' uh, faith centers around Jesus, that their life centers around community, and that their work centers around reconciliation. And I just cannot find anything wrong with that. Uh, not only that, they're, 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 they're specific enough where they're guiding and they're redemptive and they're helpful, but they're general enough to where there's some latitude in each one of them, and we can find our place in that. And I just think that it serves as a good compass for not only our church, but maybe the ways that we can think about our own faith. You know, you can think about faith in all kinds of ways. There's God, there's Muhammad, there's a lot of different ways to think about God, and God is just a generic form of, of mystery. It doesn't mean anything, you know. And so we have to assign some meaning there in the realm of God. And as Christian people, what do we do? A Christian, Christian, Christ, Jesus Christ. The first uh, mantra, the first thing that any of the early church said was Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Either Jesus is Lord or not Lord. And if you didn't think Jesus was Lord, you're not in that club. You were not in there. You couldn't be in there, right? And there are all these 
factions and uh, stuff. And you see, see Paul and John, the early church fathers, have to fight against Gnosticism and all these weird things coming into the church because, because Jesus Christ being Lord and Savior of all things, that Jesus Christ coming from God, going back to God, the whole thing, everything that he was, was cosmic in implication. It was cosmic. Right? It was big, big stuff. And so Jesus and who he says that he was is really important. And to me, you can, you can do anything you want. There's a lot of latitude in Christianity, but Jesus has to be Lord. If Jesus is not Lord, then you don't have Christianity. You have something else. You have something else. And hey, it's all, it's all good. It's because pluralism is celebrated in this country. And uh, there's room for another religion. Go start one. Uh, but that would be uh, what you would need to do if you don't think Jesus is Lord because the Bible says that. And, and, and here's what I would argue with a lot of people about the Bible. Like what the Bible says about itself. You know, if you read with it, it says strong words that the Bible's given about itself. So if you like the Bible and you think it's a good book, well, then you don't believe it because the Bible, what it says about itself is this the word of God living and active and sharper than any swords and it cuts into the body, so the spirit judges <coughs> thoughts and the attitudes of the heart and it, it will stand forever, you know, all these sorts of things about it. You say, man, I, that, that's not just a regular book or something else about it. Jesus Christ, the same way you could say a lot of things and a lot of people have. You know, I mean, he is the singular most... Uh, uh, like more art has been uh, focused on Jesus Christ than any other, in any, more songs have been written about Jesus Christ than any in history. The most popular person in all of history. Uh, coming from Palestine, dying in his early 30s, a criminal's death with not many friends. He's done pretty well in terms of notoriety. But all that, you could just say he's a good guy, he's a famous guy, and all these other world religions are glad to give him the, the mantle of being a good prophet and on and on and on. But Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Or he says, I am. And we're going to look at these I am statements today. And if Jesus said that about himself, he's not a good guy if that stuff is not true. <laughs> because he was lying to you and he was deceiving you. And uh, he's more like a Jim Jones. And uh, that could be really offensive. It ought to be. But see, we have to make choices about that stuff. And so Jesus Christ is the center of our faith. And I can see that. And so whenever we get mixed up and lost, and maybe we get tossed and turned, and maybe there's new philosophies and new books that are written that says, oh, it's all backwards. You need the Enneagram or whatever. Well, you know, you say, no, Jesus Christ is right. We're going to stay focused on that, on Jesus. And you think about life and community. And, uh, you know, when we think about how to live our lives and what we could do and everything, I mean, what do you focus on and what do you appreciate and, 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 and how do you see life working? When you close your eyes and you imagine the best life, your best self, what do you imagine? Don't tell me it's in some cabin by yourself with the rain beating on the thing and it's 8 in the morning and you're just by yourself and there's a fireplace and you're smoking a pipe or something. Like, you know, like that's trash. You imagine yourself with the people that you love. Your birthday, your special day, what do you do? Getting isolated? Going and crawling in a hole so you can be alone, not to deal with anybody's trash. Come on. You want to be about your people that love you, that you love them. You want to hang out with those people. You're going to go and eat a bologna sandwich this afternoon by yourself. Do you want to be around some people and go have a meal? Like community is so built into us. It's so innate. We want to do things with other people. You want to go fast, you go alone. You want to go far, you go together. The old Kenyan proverb. If you want to take somebody and punish them, you put them in solitary confinement. Put them by themselves. They'll go freaking insane because they cannot handle it. The hardest criminal can't handle that because we deeply need community. We're wired for community. And so our lives can be around community. It's okay to admit that. It's good. And good Christian community is helpful. Look, your people are everything. I mean, I don't care. Just go look at high school, and you can say, oh, we're not that way. We're all grown. No, no, no. We are massively in need of acceptance. In fact, I think if there's anything at the human base level need that trumps everything else, yeah, you got food and cover. Yeah, you don't want to walk out naked, and yeah, you're going to be hungry today. And if you're hungry today, you're going to not be able to think about anything else except being hungry. But after that, you're going to be lonely, and you're not going to be able to think about anything else but being lonely. And we need human beings. We need human people around us. We need community. It's okay to be that way. But Christian community is good, friends. Christian community builds you up. Other community builds you down. Go look at a high school anywhere you want to. I can tell you the people, that, you know, what are all these kids? They, you know, they 
They read in a book that they need to be a football player. You know, to, to, you know wh- wh- where, how do they figure out what they're going to be? You know, where are these people that decide to be football players? Well, maybe they're big and strong or whatever, but then, and that put them into that position. But then what about all the goth people or the skater people or the marginalized sections of, of the high school? What made them decide to, like, get all tattooed up and wear white makeup and listen to Marilyn Manson? It couldn't be because the music is good. It, it's because they found acceptance somewhere. I'll go wherever. There was a guy that, a uh, famous pastor who, uh, out in California, Francis Chan, and there was this guy that came in, he was all ganged up, and he wanted to get clean out of gangs. And he got saved and all this stuff, and they brought him in, and for about two or three weeks, he was like in the church all the time, and he calls Francis Chan. Chan I heard Francis Chan talk about this. He calls him up, he says, listen, I made a mistake. What's the problem? He's like, we well, aren't open today. And there's nothing going on tomorrow. And uh, he's like, and, and I gave up my, my gang, my family, like, because I was going to, I thought that the church was going to be like the gang, like the family, like we're going to be, and we're not. And Chan says, started to cry. He says, man, you're not wrong. We're wrong. This guy needed the community and the church was just <laughs> full of crap. And we needed to be his gang and they weren't his gang. And so community ought to be. I, I really can't see it. At the center of our lives, I see community working its way out. And I see the opposite of that being isolation, is walking around, being by yourself. And who would have an interest in us being all alone, just to, in our own feelings, in our own worlds? And You know, it's not God. The other thing, the, the, the third thing that I think is so impressive about this, this way of thinking is work. You know, when you start thinking of Christian work or work or what do you want to do, we all have jobs and we all have a call. We have a calling to be uh, to, to be a Christian, we have a, a vocational calling. We have the calling of the day. Everybody's a vocational calling. You have to work. Paul uh, did tents and did tents in his, in, in his extra time and he worked. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you can think about your work. In fact, we love work and we think about work all the time. And our whole, we talk about life work and work gives us a lot of meaning. You know, God created work in the garden before the curse, before the fall. Work was there. It was good. In fact, God works for six days and says everything he did out of his work was good. He only rests one day out of seven, okay? So he doesn't rest for six and work on one. He works for six and rests on one. And the, and the, and the good work for six is what made the rest possible, on the seventh, work is built in an eight, okay? It feels good. I don't care. I know we're lazy and screwed up now, and I know nobody wants to go rake their leaves. But man, when my daddy made me rake the leaves and I made $25 and it took me all day, golly, man, at the end of the day, I felt good about it. And then they all came down the next day. I felt terrible. But I felt good because good accomplished work is good, and it feels good. And nothing makes me feel like trash more than doing absolutely nothing, being absolutely worthless, right? Sitting there and watching everything on Netflix to the fact that now they have suggestion. Don't know what to watch? Just let us choose for you. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, like, man, we don't even know what to watch. Hey, what do I need to watch on Netflix? God, man, nothing makes me feel worse than doing nothing. It's fine for one day, but not six days, not seven days in a row. You can't do that. So you have to have work. And meaningful work is one of the great secrets of life, friends, because we need purpose. You've got to have purpose in your life, right? And a lot of people hate their jobs. They don't see any purpose in it. They don't see any any intrinsic value in it, and so it's difficult for them. It's only a mechanism to make money, and they get jaded because the whole society is based on a, a capitalistic system and everything, and they, and they don't feel like they can get ahead. But we need to see and, and have our work. Uh, 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 we need to see that, that change. We need to, to find joy in the work. We need to find Jesus in the work. We need to find work that's meaningful, something. And that's a hard thing, and you can read books. It's like, what color is your parachute? And a thousand books you can read on vocational uh, choice. But... What about Christian work? And what about as a church, what kind of work should we do? And as Christian peoples, what unique offerings could we bring to the world, okay? And I think these Mennonites are right. If you're going to pick a type of work, reconciliatory work would be the most Christian, would be the most uh, uh, bent towards the heart of God. Because, you know, you can't for- be forget. you got to be forgiven in order to know what it means to forgive. And he who's been forgiven much loves much. And a lot of these lessons, the world's never known. But first grade, as you learn forgiveness at Christian, at Christian school, you realize you're forgiven. And once you're forgiven, you get a clean slate, and you feel like that feels like it's a great feeling. But, but people don't know how to do that, and they don't know how it works. And, uh, and, and we've talked a lot about this before, but Dick's been writing a book about it for several years now. You know, Christian voices, they get nothing in terms of world history. But I 
telling you, and you go and you look under the rocks and you'll find it. There is not all the, all the de- hospitals for death, all the hospitals for <coughs> blind and mute and Helen Keller and all those people, all of the hospitals, they're all Catholic charity hospitals or Baptist charity hospitals or Methodist hospitals, all of the health care. Most of all the technology we have, most of our, our democratic form of governance, you could just go on and on and on and on. It's all based on the altruistic willingness of Christian people who are led by Jesus Christ to do things that were selfless. There was nothing about it that get, got them anything. Go look at, uh, the, you know, where, where Henry Nowen worked. It was, a, it was a hospital for the mentally handicapped. Fully mentally handicapped people, these people could do nothing for themselves. The world says, don't give a damn about you. Let's just euthanize you people. You don't mean anything. But Christian people had to come in and say, no, 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 these are precious people. They're made in the image of God. They're important. That was a new thing. And today it just sounds like it's American or whatever, but it's not. It came from Christianity. And equality came from your New Testament where it says, in Jesus Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, Crazy re- revolutionary idea in first century. Now it seems regular to us, but our country happens to be built on Christian principles, and so we take it for granted. And today, all these people are telling you that Christianity is nothing but a bunch of killjoys, nothing but a bunch of uh, 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 you know Republicans or whatever that 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 just want to take away rights. And we have this huge war being fought, uh, but it took Christian people working. And it took people, Christian people being influenced by the Holy Spirit to do things that way. And so our work, friends, ought to be inspired by Jesus, and it ought to be along the lines of reconciliation. That is the, the proper work. We could build buildings, and we could do great services, and we could pick up trash on the side of the roads, and we could you know, do all kinds of good work. But to me, this is a good guiding life. Now, I haven't even gotten the scripture. We're almost uh, out of time. So... Uh, I, I was stuck in the first one. I, I, I plan on spending a lot of time on the centrality of Jesus Christ, Christology, if you want to call it that, Christology. You can look through the scriptures, and you can find Jesus everywhere you look. Last week, we just went through some of the Old Testament characters. In fact, every just about every Old Testament character that you studied in Sunday school growing up is a Christ figure. And, it, and it, there's a picture there that shows us uh, a Christ at, uh, there. In fact, all of the Old Testament shadows of these realities that we find in the New Testament. Uh, in the book of John, uh, John is, wants to be like Genesis. The guy that wrote it, he wanted it to sound like Genesis in the beginning. You go look at Genesis and you, you, you parallel John and Genesis and they, they seem really similar. And John crafted this whole book and he wanted us to understand certain things about Jesus. He did it this real special way. Matthew, Mark, Luke are called synoptic gospels and they're all based on the same sources and everything. You can go and you look and find that Mark was the source for Luke and Matthew, etc., etc. and they've got some other sources over here. But John is entirely different, written entirely different, doesn't have the same stuff in it, none of the same sources, got all these long sermons that Jesus gives, all these beloved passages that we appreciate about uh, uh, come, that Jesus said that come from the book of John. John was apparently the beloved disciple, the closest to Jesus. And so if you're going to ask somebody who's dead or not hear any more about uh, that person's life, who would you ask? Their best friend would know a whole lot about them. And so we get this sense that we, this deeper uh, uh, view into the, the heart of Jesus through the book of John. And John, like any other author, he, he, he puts little literary devices in, a little clues in so that you'll be enticed and you'll, you'll like what you see and you'll, you'll compare notes and you'll see stuff. And, it'll, and it was supposed to be this sort of experience where you realize, uh, you know, who Jesus is. And so in John, there's all these little specific things. And, and one of the, uh, there's seven, like, miracles, for instance, in, in the book of John. There's seven of them. You know, and seven is like the complete number, too. So that's all important. So there's seven special miracles. And there's seven I am statements. And uh, the I am statements come from the Old Testament. And it's sort of this thing. And in Exodus 3.14, you know, remember Moses? He's, there's a burning bush. And uh, he says, who are you? He says, I am who I am. And uh, I told a joke about that once. It didn't go well. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, yeah, the HR liked it. They wanted to hear about it. It was so good. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, I am who I am. And I even read, I heard a song about that. Uh, uh, Vampire Weekend's got a song about that, where the guy's so mad because he wants to know God, and God doesn't give him much. Just I am what I am. And uh, he's like, who can live that way? Who, how can we? What is that? It's not personal. It's, 
but it's filled with mystery and, and uh, there's a lot of books written about what I am that I am means. But it, to, to me, it, it, it's this sort of was, is, and will be this sort of all-encompassing, non-changing being. And you can fill in the blank. I am everything. I am. I am. I am what? I am all of it. I'm the creator. I'm the beginning and the end. You know, he didn't say all that then, but the introductory statement in uh, uh, Exodus 3.14 was, I am what I am. And Jesus says, I am the same way. And when he was saying that in the first century, especially to a bunch of Pharisees, they knew what he meant. He meant, I am God. And this is basically saying, I am God. I am God. I am what I am. I am who I am. I was, and I am, and I will be. And he uh, explains himself in different ways. And so there's seven I am statements in the book of John, and they're all supposed to be pointing to Jesus being the central figure in all things. Okay, we'll go through them real quick because we only have like five minutes left, and you can go do your homework. Uh, and uh, just eat the chicken and spit out the bones. All right, first one, I am the bread of life. John 6, the first one, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Bread was always reckoned with the word of God. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And bread from heaven came down manna. They got a little bit, just enough for the day, each day, right? And so what was he saying? The sustenance, your sustenance doesn't come from the meals you're eating, your real sustenance, spiritual food. And what is that spiritual food and where does it go? And how can anyone minister to the human heart? God does miracles every day because he touches the human heart. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who feeds on me will live because of me. I don't miss meals, do you? I know if I do miss a meal. But do we think about Jesus that way? Do we connect with him as we would meals? You know, in Psalms it says, evening in morning and at noon, I will cry aloud, and he will hear my voice. And Psalms 119 says, seven times a day, I will cry out to God, and he will hear me. Do we talk to God? Do we listen to God? Do you exercise your spirit? Because look, here's the thing. This is for spiritual people. Spiritual gifts are for spiritual people. You have to be spiritual. It starts first. You know, the spiritual life is, first of all, a life, right? Like, it is, and so do you have a spirit, but if you don't exercise that spirit, then you might as well not have one. And how do you exercise your spirit? The same way you exercise your body. You don't have to go run a marathon this afternoon, but you ought to go walk around the block at least. Do something. Do something. Pray. Do you have a fixed time where you pray and eat the bread of life? Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. Second one is light of the world. 8.12, when Jesus spoke again, the people had said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you read the verse before and the context around here, there's a lot about witness. He, the, the Pharisees say, yeah, say you're the light of the world. You're saying I am God. You're saying you're the light of the world. But you're your own witness, and that's not valid. And light doesn't need a witness, does it? Like the light doesn't turn on and somebody has to label it and say, hey, light has shown. Can you see? No, the light is on. You can see. Obviously, there's a source. The sun comes up. The light's shown. The light is a witness unto itself. You don't have to be like, Oh, there's light here. There must be evidence around here that the sun's shining. No, it's like obvious. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I don't need a witness. I don't need a witness. I illuminate everything, right? Everything. And in him, there's no darkness at all. Jesus is likening himself to that, a beautiful picture. The third one, the door. So Jesus says, yeah, truly, truly, I'm the door of the sheep. Now, it's inanimate. You have to think about what's around that door. And a door can shut you out, or it can open it up and let you in, and that can seem weird to us. But uh, he talks in the, in, the, in the context of shepherds here. And, uh, uh, you know, a shepherd's house was connected to uh, the sheep pen. And so if you were going in the door into the, if you're a sheep and you're going into the door, you're going home. And Jesus, I think, in his essence, is, uh, I'm the door. You, you come home through me. This is the way home. In uh, 10, 11, and 14, he says, I'm the good shepherd. So it's very similar. The good shepherd. We don't think a lot about shepherds anymore. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen a shepherd uh, in, uh, around here. But, it, you know, they knew, uh, you know, how that goes. They're sheep, and the shepherd leads and guides those sheep. He's responsible for those sheep for their well being. He's supposed to guide them, give them good things. Uh, and they're all supposed to stay together and just trust that shepherd. And Jesus says, I'm a good shepherd. Uh, I, I, I'm. I'm I've done a lot of good things. Which ones are you mad at me for? Which ones are you crucifying me for? Uh, 
He says, I am the resurrection and the life in 11 25. This is after he, re- he raised up Lazarus from the dead, his friend. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Uh, and so these things are obvious. You know what that is. The way, the truth, and the life is 14 6, uh, it, it is, which could be seen as basically a, uh, a summary of all of it. The way, the truth, and the life. I think it's interesting that he's the means. He's the way. He's the means. It used to be called the way, Christianity. At first it was called the way. And he says, no, 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 no. It's not, I am that. It's not a religion over here. It's not this movement. Yeah, that's all happening, but that is all because of me. I am that. I am the way. So like, you know, we don't think about the way. We just want to get to the end, destination. But the means, God always cares about the God cares about the process as much as the product, if we were athletes. That's my, how we think about it. Uh, and, and so the, the way, the means to the end. He is the end, but he is also the way to get to the end. He is everything, all in all, everything we need. And the final one of the seven, the I Am statements, is in John 15, a great chapter, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, one of the best chapters you can ever read in the Bible, John 15. I am the true vine of my father's. Uh, the gardener. And then I think in five, it says, anyone who remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. And we don't think about vines much anymore, friends. But back in the day, these were important things. And uh, it's where you got wine and all this stuff. And you can just imagine there's a real strong vine. He says, near the branches. And so you have to just remain. And if you just stick with that life source and remain, it's going to work out. It's going to work out. But apart from me, he says, you can do nothing. And these are just images of Jesus. And what is he doing you know, I close my eyes and I imagine him and some disciples walking around. They walked everywhere they went. They didn't Uber around, you know. They didn't have downtime on their phones. They had time to sit and think and talk. And Jesus just walked. When they said, I want to be in your school of, of discipleship, he says, I right, come with me. Come follow me. Well, what's the school? Everyday life. Everyday thoughts. Everyday uh, illustrations and metaphors. And I just imagine Jesus seeing bread and saying, no, no, no. I, yeah, bread. Let me show you. I'll take that one and show you how I'm that. Or consider the lilies. Or, or look, I'm the light of the world. And, and, and all this stuff, he's going around, and it's just in everyday life. He's being able to use everyday examples to show us that we can find him everywhere, and that he is everything to us, the center of our faith, where all the power is, friends. Where all the power is, where all the authority is, where all the grace is, where all the truth is, uh, you know. Grace and truth come through Jesus Christ all there. It's all ours. And, uh, you know, you all got lucky. We got lucky. Because if anybody's going to get excited and fall in love with you, this was the guy. And and and, and we got lucky. Uh, C.S. Lewis says that uh, we're sitting around wasting our lives with food and drink when there could be inexpressible sheer joy that's present to us at all times. But most of the time, we're not seeing it. We're not looking for it. We're in the middle of our mess. But that's why I think that the, the writer in Hebrews says, let's keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You can keep your eyes fixed on him. For the joy set before him endured the cross, it's going to shame set at the right hand of God. Uh, so like, we can consider him. We can consider him. And no, and no matter what we're going through, we know that he's been through some similar. He's with us, and he plans to take us to the end. What's another thing? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And so we can trust him and trust Jesus with our lives. Friends, uh, maybe it's just a good reminder to you when you go back out today and you hear all of the thousands of other philosophies of life and all of the other leaders that you could follow and all the other words that you could hold on to and get behind. And think about this, this Jesus Christ, this Lamb of God, and how he's treated you and what he offers to you. I think it's a good deal, a really, really good deal. And I think that you and I ought to consider ourselves lucky that we even know about it because there's a lot of people that don't.